I'm like a shark that just got, that's hungry and just got a taste of blood for the first time. So Randy Orton should be very worried. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on get, again becoming the number one contender for and the your WWE future, Championship. And your future? Future WWE Champion. Yeah. And the American Dream. And the American Dream. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jinder. Congratulations thank you. again. I, 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 I'll wait till he leaves now. No, I think we got to keep the thing shot. with Dusty. Of you know, course. Dusty American can. Dream. But I understand his 100%. point. 100%. It is Review of Smackdown. It's John Pollock, but waiting is not to my right. Joining me, it is Bartender Dave, who is making his debut on Review of Smackdown as he quietly makes his way onto all of the different shows. <laughs> oh, hooray! Thank you very much for having me on, John. This is a uh, this is an honor to be on this show. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, uh, a couple of these into the future, Dave, I'm sure you will not be saying it, it is an honor. <laughs> I, was, I think was... every guest reviewer has only so many 205 lives in them. Oh, my God. Yeah. And uh, like to tell you the truth, well, a lot of you know that I take handwritten notes and I've got 15 pages. Holy of moly. Yeah. My wrist is killing me and not like back in high school, if you know what I mean. I uh, <laughs> I can't believe you took 15 pages of notes for uh, what we are about to embark upon. What what would be the breakdown? What what did SmackDown entail notes wise? What what were the number for SmackDown versus 205 Live? And of course, talking smack, which uh, I, I I could describe maybe in one word, which we'll get to later. Yeah, I got uh, I got nine pages for SmackDown. I got uh, two pages for. Uh, talking smack and four pages for uh, what was the other one? Two hundred five live. Man, you should, two hundred five live is the hardest thing to watch. I think you should be writing two hundred five live. Maybe that. I know, right? I'm looking for anything after this week's show. Oh my god, I know what you mean. It was crazy. Now I reached out to you to come uh-huh. join me, and then got your reply that you were in Mexico. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We were down in uh, just outside of uh, Playa del Carmen uh, on the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, fantastic weather. It was it was a great trip. It was uh, both kids came with us, and uh, they they are fantastic flyers. We were kind of dreading it, but uh, they did really great, and we had a great time. We had five minutes of rain, and that was on the bus ride to the uh, to the resort from the airport when we first got there, and then it was uh, thirty one. Uh, every single day it was it was just beautiful have you gone on many trips that involve planes with your children before this was the first one this was the first one the first that's why we were we were kind of dreading it because like uh well dustin's uh he's eight years old and he's he's now he he went to ottawa with my parents on a flight but that that flight doesn't really even count you're up in the air and you come right back down so but hollis is five years old and uh he's a bit of a drama queen Uh, he's not listening is he but uh yeah so uh he they both did really well and uh, all the other kids on the plane were absolute nightmares and they they sat there watching their movies playing their video games on the ipads which uh i i love those things they are a godsend for any uh parent or parent to be get an ipad they're fantastic they seem like the greatest investment possible for traveling for children Exactly. I, I downloaded a couple of, uh, what do you call it, uh, Royal Rumbles onto each of them and uh, a couple of movies onto each of them as well. I have never watched Sing so many times in my life, though. <laughs> kind of sick of that movie. It, it was really good the first time I watched it, but now I oh, God, <laughs> enough already. <laughs> you know, I wonder if the WWE Network is going to start to incorporate that much how Netflix has done now, where you could download certain events and, and things off the network because that's not there yet for yeah i mean yeah. the network just added chromecast which welcome to five years ago wwe yeah, exactly. so i mean <laughs> by this stretch it'll be 2021 before we have uh, download capabilities from the network yeah, those uh, those uh, matches that I downloaded were uh, off of our Apple TV that I had bought in the years before the uh, uh, before the network came along. Well, uh, I'm glad you had a good trip. It sounds like it was a, a fun trip. Oh, it was fantastic. They both they, everybody got uh, lucha masks, which is great. Right, right from Mexico, they're all Rey Mysterio. They they love their Rey Mysterio. And then you raced home and yeah. had to watch three and a half hours of WWE programming because of this asshole John Pollock <laughs> asking you for a favor. <laughs> Oh no! It's uh, it was it was uh, like I, you know you you, you have a nice uh, vacation. You might as well jump feet first back into it. And uh, I had a great time watching. Uh, like I said, two hundred five was kind of hard to watch, but uh, uh, 
I, I enjoyed most of it. Uh, I'm a bit confused because I, I missed two weeks worth of uh, shows and I didn't get to listen to any of the uh, podcasts at the uh, down there because I didn't have uh, the capabilities of downloading them. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm a bit confused still. <laughs> well, well, we'll try and unconfuse you on this show, though. I think there's going to be more questions than answers after uh, some of these. Now, in a oh typical week, Dave, do you pretty yes. much watch... All of the these shows, like the like SmackDown, Talking Smack, Two Hundred Five Live, is this regular viewing for you on a non vacation week? Uh, Smack SmackDown for sure. Uh, I, I rely on you and Way for uh, Two Hundred Five and SmackDown Live. Which is kind of the reason I think we've continued doing this because I never hear anyone rave about Two Hundred Five Live. I never get any feedback about Two Hundred Five Live. I never see anything about Two Hundred Five Live. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's kind of gone by the wayside, but well, it was, it was always by the wayside, I think. But I, I really, uh, I, I'm kind of upset the way that it's it's come about because they've put some guys on there with some fantastic abilities that could like. Uh, uh, Granted, a lot of them would be lost in the shuffle if they were just on the main roster. But you got guys like Austin Aries that I think would be really good on the main roster. But now he's just pigeonholed. Like they pigeonhole so many people as cruiserweights now. It's like back in the day when we had the uh, the whole cruiserweight division before. And it, I, I just wish that they'd graduate them onto the main roster because like some of them are really really good but it, it also helps a lot like the uh, uh what's his name uh, neville i've never seen him better and he is such a fantastic heel like he's doing the best work of his career i think but i think that if you put him on the uh, uh main roster as a as this uh heel character i think it would go over really well yeah i think it's a case of just you just uh, outlined it i mean the the mm-hmm. amount of talent you have on this show and compare it to last summer when you did the draft and the raw side with the women you had all your key players with the exception of becky lynch and on the smackdown side i think everyone went into it with very low expectations and they ended up overachieving i feel on smackdown whereas on 205 live you have all this great talent and it's just underachieving and it's not the matches it's the scenarios they're put in it's these god-awful characters that they have to portray and it's just it it's become velocity which was the fear yeah. everyone had when this show was thrown out. I mean, it's just, it's it's matches. And this atmosphere, I feel we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> We'll save that. Let's get into SmackDown first. Let's do it. Uh, we were at the KFC Yum Center in yeah, Louisville, Kentucky. Something else, yum. <laughs> show kicked off. Uh, they did have a graphic for Matt Anawahi, who you may remember as Rosie during uh, his time as uh, Three Minute Warning with Jamal Umaga. And then later is the superhero in training who passed away uh, earlier this week at the age of 47. So it was nice of them to have a graphic for him at the start of the show. And yeah. uh, the older brother of Roman Reigns. Yeah, I didn't know that until I said like like when I when we started watching the show and I saw that I was I was taken aback because I didn't even know that that happened. And when I started uh, researching him, I, I was actually surprised to see that he was the older brother of Roman Reigns. I didn't know that. I just thought they were somewhere uh, related. I didn't know they were that close. Yeah, really, really unfortunate. Forty seven yeah. is obviously way, way too young for for a guy to be uh, passing. Yeah, it's only five years away for me. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> Charlotte started the show. <laughs> and she says she's already lost her patience after seven days and asks if Shane and Brian went on summer vacation or if they're binge watching Fast and the Furious to set up the line, I'm fastly getting furious. Yeah, is that proper grammar? I didn't No, uh... this is not. And Microsoft <laughs> Word is just yelling at me with this red underline of fastly. <laughs> which is not a recognized word. This yeah, felt I thought like... it was funny when she when she said that about him being on or them being on vacation, because uh, Dustin swears that he saw Daniel Bryan sipping a tequila sunrise at Senior Frogs in Playa del Carmen on Monday afternoon. So uh, she might have been right, or he might, yeah. Perhaps maybe her, him and Bree have this secret birth that is happening uh, <laughs> internationally. Yeah, what like dual citizenship? <laughs> uh, she cannot believe she has not been given a title match yet. So Naomi comes out. And says, we don't have kings or queens on SmackDown Live. That was 11 years ago with Booker T and yep. Charmel. Uh, <laughs> she says that champions are the ones that are here on SmackDown. She's been watching Charlotte for a long time, is not scared of her, and, say, and says we can do this now. As she attacks Charlotte with this forearm, sends her to the floor. They continue fighting. Shane McMahon enters, says they are going to fight tonight, but Charlotte has to earn that title shot, so it's non-title tonight. If she wins, she will get her title match next week, and then when you think this segment is over, 
Charlotte goes after Naomi again, dumping her on the floor, holds up the title, and then as we get ready for this to fade to the back or to a break, no, Naomi returns again. This was the <laughs> Peter Griffin chicken fight, and yeah. she sent Charlotte to the floor to take back her title. So a lot of physicality in this opening segment, and uh, clearly uh, Charlotte positioned as the, the top female heel, um, even though I really got the sense that she was coming over and they might even give her a short uh, baby face run. That is not the case. And we're, we're going to this program really early in, th- in Charlotte's tenure on SmackDown. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a, fan, uh, a Naomi fan at all, but I found her uh, promo far more natural and heartfelt than uh, Charlotte's. I thought she did a really good job. And uh, I, it, to, to, on the, the stipulation, I've never liked this, uh, you have to beat the champ to face the champ step. It's, it, it, if, if she's big enough or a big enough threat, then just put the championship on the line. I thought it was kind of ridiculous, or at least fight different people to get there. Because if you just get and to beat the champ clean to get another shot, it, it doesn't make that much sense to me at all. What What are you not a fan of Naomi uh, on? What what, are uh, you, what doesn't do it for you? I, sh- I still see, okay. Two things. I, I still see her as uh, one of the Funkadactyls. I think that kind of uh, ruined her, her career back then. And I, I, I think I might be the only one that finds her uh, entrance extremely annoying. Oh, wow. Do yeah, you, I really don't like it. Do you have a history of seizures or? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Epilepsy attacks. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just don't think it. Uh, like it's, it's really neat to watch, but to, to, to over and over and over again, I just uh, find it a bit tiring. Uh, you know what I find really tiring, Dave? Uh, green light still lives. April 2nd, WrestleMania <laughs> took place, and I'm still hearing this fucking song on SmackDown for this Did You Know fact. I heard that, and I wrote it down right away. I'm like, oh, John's going to love this. <laughs> 17 days later, I thought we had put this song to rest, and it just comes right back into our consciousness. <laughs> oh, this is the worst song that is just, it just gets stuck. Yeah. Like it's still like I'm driving and I'm at a red light and this fucking song creeps into my (laughs) psyche. (laughs) Natalia was in Shane McMahon's office and she is very upset that Charlotte is getting the number one contenders match. So Charlotte is like the the George St. Pierre of this division. She's just holding everything up for the other contenders. She Mm. says she deserves to be champion. Shane says that she had her opportunity at WrestleMania, and Natalia basically laughs off that match and says, that wasn't really much of an opportunity. Let's be honest. That was a five-minute match that was squashed in between two big matches. <laughs> Shane said, well, you just should have asked, and you didn't. Carmella and James Ellsworth are in. They agree with Natalia about Charlotte getting whatever she wants, but Ellsworth says Carmella is the only one that deserves to be champion. Then Tamina walks in. She wants a title shot as well. And Natalia wants to talk to all of them because she has a plan, which I was still curious about at the end of this show, Dave, what this grand plan was. Yeah, exactly. Nothing really happened with that. And I, I, I couldn't understand what, like, I, who's who's the heel, who's the face in this? Because it looks like we've got, what now, one, two, three, four, four heels it's, all feuding. It's everyone and, against Naomi. And, but yeah. now Charlotte is in this weird middle role where she's upset these three heels and she's feuding with Naomi. I'm so confused. So there's different levels. <laughs> oh, it gets even worse. <laughs> okay. Let us get into the number one contenders match. Yeah. Not to be confused with the number one contenders match last week for the United States title, which eliminated AJ Styles from this match. And for whatever reason, Baron Corbin also not incorporated into this match. Yeah. So we have Dolph Ziggler, Jinder Mahal, Sami Zayn, Eric Rowan, Luke Harper, and Mojo Rawley. Now, on Monday, Dave, when this match was announced, okay, what was your thinking here? It's it's the post payback program for the WWE Championship, and these are your six options. What what was bartender Dave contemplating as an outcome? Uh, well, first of all, this is like Dolph Ziggler's what his 800th chance to to be a number one contender, and I, I couldn't. <laughs> and kind of has a program as well already yeah, in place. Exactly. And you got Mahal who lost what every single match he had on Raw. And but, und- but like, undefeated on SmackDown. <laughs> yeah, so now he comes down to SmackDown. Way to make SmackDown look like a big show, you know. But and and Harper, who's in fantastic shape right now, he's the only one that I thought actually had a chance. Because like come on, Mojo Raleigh and 
Eric Rowan? No, no. I thought Harper was the only one that had a chance, or maybe Sami Zayn. But it was just, it was weird. The first thing I thought was, where's Baron Corbin? Where's AJ Styles? Like, those those are the two names that you'd think should be up there. Like, everybody knows that I'm a huge Baron Corbin fan, but, like, why wouldn't why wouldn't you put those two in? Like, I have to make a correction. Uh-oh. Jinder Mahal, not undefeated on SmackDown, because in his <laughs> debut last week, he lost to Mojo. Oh lost clean to him in 243. <laughs> With you the Gronkowski six, shit. Yeah, you got six of the most forgettable quote unquote superstars you'll find on the main roster. Like, where's Bo Dallas to make this a seven pack? <laughs> but just think about that, okay? If you were going to go with this outcome, and last week Jinder is losing in under three minutes to Mojo Raleigh, like, this to me just feels like something that was ju- just a decision coming out of nowhere. Like, yeah. there was no even, even throwing out the semblance of, well, he's now on a new brand and he's going to be uh, positioned differently. Eh, there was none of that last week. No, no. And like JBL said, someone's life is going to change forever by winning this match tonight. And I wholeheartedly disagreed because all this means is a title shot, loss, and back to obscurity. Well, let's, uh, I'm not going to go through all of this here, but <laughs> yeah. just some highlights. Uh, early on, uh, they went through a commercial break and came back and did this. Uh, This sequence of superplexes, one by Raleigh to Ziggler, then Harper to Rowan off another turnbuckle, and then Zayn with a sunset flip powerbomb to Jinder Mahal. This is where JBL mentioned that the winner will face Randy Orton at Backlash in Chicago. Uh, Essentially, JBL of the belief that Bray Wyatt has no chance in this House of Horrors match. No, Uh, that's not a title match? I'm saying it is, is, but I'm just stating that he obviously feels that Orton's going to retain his title at at payback. Yeah, because it didn't seem they didn't mention if that was a title match, or at least I didn't catch it at all. I was I was kind of confused because they're they're on separate brands. Would anyway? I'm so confused. It's it's a good point. I don't know if they've actually stated this fact yet. If it is indeed a title match, I think everyone assumes it's a title match. Yeah, uh, that's because it's Bray's uh, rematch. Yeah, you'd think. Well. That's one way out of thing. I mean, it almost makes more sense to make this a non-title match because it it eliminates all the confusion that this match has going in of what happens if Bray wins and by default no one assumes Bray is winning this match because of all the problems it creates. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't even be a title program to be quite no. honest. Uh yeah. Zane set up for a Haluva kick into a Ziggler super kick. Harper then killed Ziggler with a lariat. Everyone gets sent to the floor. Harper hit a suicide dive to Jinder and then returned, hitting one to Zayn and Raleigh together. Rowan delivered a spin kick and then powerbombed Ziggler onto the floor, onto all four. We got a second commercial break. Comes back. Mahal pulls Harper to the floor, throws him into the steps, and then Mrs. Zayn runs into the post in the corner, which is just a spot they are doing to death. Just yeah. on this show alone, the <laughs> missing the guy and running into the post. Zane hit a Topicon Hero to Harper and then a split-legged moonsault to Raleigh, an exploder to Jinder in the corner, and he calls for a Haluva kick. But then the Bollywood boys appear on the floor in white suits, grabbing Zane's feet so he can't deliver the Haluva kick. He turns around, distracted, and then gets hit with this Cobra clutch into a slam by Jinder Mahal, who pins Sami Zayn. A sequence of words I never thought I would repeat in 2017. And Jinder Mahal wins in 18 minutes and 38 seconds to go to Backlash. And what an appropriate name of a pay-per-view for Jinder Mahal to be headlining. Yeah, exactly. And, like, how much heat does uh, Sami Zayn have backstage, like, to have have to be fed to a guy that virtually and virtually everyone else he's ever faced? Like, come on. I I know there has to be, uh, like, pin me, pay, pay me's to to make the universe go around, but to put Sami Zayn in that spot is, is kind of insulting to me. Like he's got a fantastic theme song, fantastic move set, and the crowd loves him. How much longer before they, like they sully him so much that no one else, no one takes him seriously anymore. It really, it, it's, it, it's mind boggling to me that they, they do this. Like you've got so many other guys that you could pin, but for him to take it, it's, it's, it, it's getting tired already. It seems that you look at these six too, and the way this match progressed and if you were to list, Dave, from one to six, the the performances, who stood out, I think it's it was clear Jinder was a number six in this match. I mean, this oh, is not sure. like this guy has he's rising to the occasion and is opening people's eyes. Hey, I am all for trying to rehab guys or present them, take them from one spot and, and slot them higher. But mm-hmm. Jinder Mahal has shown me nothing. I mean, he 
drop Finn Balor on his head last week, and oh, thankfully God. Finn Balor isn't out longer uh, from that concussion. Mm-hmm. But you just look at this. I mean, he was the least spectacular person in this show, and the idea that we are going to get a month-long program, and maybe longer, with him and Randy Orton, which, my God, the chemistry these two had when Orton came out afterwards was just putting me to sleep. <laughs> Yeah, it was like non-existent, like like you like said. Just, there's no heat for this guy at all. Like you really have your work cut out for you trying to rehab Jinder, who may I add, they booked to lose in three minutes last week. Yeah, to Mojo <laughs> Rawley. And I was yeah. like, this match. If you were into this match, it wasn't because of Jinder Mahal. Until the finish, he was non-existent in this match. Yeah, exactly. And like his promo uh, ability was was pretty good. Like he did a good job on the mic, although I didn't like what he said. I thought it was a rehash of that we've heard time and time again throughout uh, the the years prior. But like instead of making a statement to the champion, Jinder chooses to stand there like a schmuck. Then and then I guess he just leaves as soon as Bray comes on the Titan Tron. Like he does nothing. After it was the match. it was really bad the way he was positioned after this because Renee yeah. is interviewing him. He did get a lot of booze. He mm-hmm. calls himself the Maharaja and says he doesn't fit the stereotype of the All-American and asks if it's because of his family's wealth, having higher education, or speaking two languages, and they don't accept diversity, and he will be the next WWE champion. So Randy comes out, congratulates Mahal, but says his prize will not be the title. And just like that, pivots <laughs> and says he doesn't know what a House of Horrors match is, but if it's like the last house he was brought to, he's going to burn Bray down to the <laughs> ground. And then Bray's on the screen for a Bray Wyatt promo with highlights of Orton burning down the compound and says he may walk into the House of Horrors as the man, but he promises he will never walk out. Never. Yeah. Yeah. And Randy's... All, this whole time, Jinder must have just uh, gingerly walked out to the floor <laughs> and gone to the back. Like, what a what an afterthought he was presented in after his own match. And yeah. I'm sorry, but for Jinder, I mean, Randy Orton is not the opponent to necessarily bring a guy up to his level. I mean, Randy will work at a certain level, but this is not his strong suit when it comes to um, performing a miracle here with Jinder Mahal. So I am going in with low expectations of this pay-per-view match. Yeah, as I as as am I, and like Randy's arson streak is going to continue. It seems like he just wants to burn everything down. How this guy hasn't been arrested yet is mind-boggling as well. I'm using that term a lot, mind-boggling on this show. <laughs> well, there was a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> there was a new day spot with a checkoff list of all the things they are bringing to SmackDown, and they are coming soon. Then there was a video feature on Shinsuke Nakamura, who did not appear on the actual show. It was just this video feature, and mm. it seems because this was twice um this moniker given to him it looks like they're going to refer to him as the artist known as shinsuke nakamura oh oh boy well you know like (laughs) so maybe instead of shinsuke nakamura he's just gonna have a symbol (laughs) well like like it's gonna be like uh, the air jordan but it's gonna be a knee yeah and oh my god That'd be fantastic. Uh, yeah, like I've said on uh, What's Next, uh, like hit, I, I, I thought that by the end of his run in NXT, the shine was kind of off of him. And I think it's a, it's a good time to call him up and, and give him a little refresh. I don't know about this artist known as it makes me think of uh, Prince Iakea. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. One of the big values uh, of Nakamura as well, Dave, is that you are now taking him to new cities that Mm -hmm. i mean if they have gone to these cities with nxt it's been much smaller venues that he is a great hook to keep people in that building so that they don't walk out on 205 live which was the role john cena had a lot was just promising a dark match with him that you can now uh you utilize for nakamura because i I think that will keep a lot of people won't make them hot for 205 live but may keep them in their seat for an extra hour Oh, for sure. Like he's got, uh, he just oozes charisma and love everything about him. So he's probably a great position to put him in. People, people will stay to watch him for sure. And I would make him special and not be wrestling every week. He does not translate well to your two, three minute television match, even, Mm -hmm. and even putting on a lengthy two segment match. I would want to save those for Nakamura and not just make him just like every other guy, like your 
and, and become like a Seth Rollins, where you can expect a big match out of him almost every week. SmackDown, you don't have three hours to fill. You don't need to be uh, doing that every week. I think he should be someone really special when he does wrestle. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Like, it, and like he, they put him on so many times on NXT, and like I said, I thought that his shine had kind of faded. So if you keep him off of television every sing or uh, off of television, don't uh, every once in a while, it'll it'll do well for his character until he gets uh, the hang of everything that he needs to. Renee was backstage with AJ Styles, and he says it doesn't matter if he faces Owens or Jericho for the U.S. title. He says he has home field advantage because this is the house that he built. The KFC Yum Center <laughs> by Styles Construction. Yeah. <laughs> Baron walks in. Styles says he beat him in Zane last week. And Baron calls Styles a neurotic little cockroach and says he approached Owens like a man last week. Styles challenges Baron to a fight tonight, and they're going to have a match. And that was yeah. that. Yeah. And, and no issue from either man that they are not in this WWE title contenders match tonight. Yeah. Yeah, totally head scratching. Like AJ and Baron and wait, battling over who gets to face the US champ while Jinder Mahal is our number one contender for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Like it's just so backwards <laughs> from a logic standpoint why you would create a contender for your secondary title, eliminating obvious, uh, arguably your biggest guy in AJ mm -hmm. Styles. Like if you're just thinking of this from a logic standpoint, it's just so backwards. Yeah, completely. Charlotte is backstage getting ready for her match, and she walks by Natalia, Tamina, and Carmella, who is with Ellsworth, and they exchange words. She walks by, knocking into Natalia's shoulder, hmm. and Natalia is sarcastically stating how honored they are to be in her presence. And this was the extent of the plan. It's a good plan. <laughs> I don't know what the plan entailed, but this was it. This was the climax of the plan. So yeah. uh, Natalia... I don't know. If this was Celebrity Apprentice, she'd be in trouble as the team leader. Yeah. Naomi and Charlotte, non-title match. Early on, she applied this uh, inverted triangle, uh, figure four head scissors to Naomi, flipped Naomi over repeatedly. Naomi comes back with leg kicks while Charlotte chopped her, and then Naomi did the, the rapid-fire kicks. There was a Hurricane Rana by Naomi that got blocked, and both flew over the top to the floor going through a commercial. Then Charlotte missed a knee drop, Leaps off the ropes with a high kick, and then there's repeated strikes. Naomi hits a Hurricane Rana. And then Naomi went for this wheelbarrow into a stunner, but didn't get any hold of Charlotte's head. So this was a <laughs> phantom stunner that Charlotte uh, sold anyway. And then the rear view gets avoided as Charlotte just kicks her from behind and hits the natural selection to win the match in 12.52 and sets up the title match for next week. Yeah, like it's like seriously though. Even though I have my problems with uh, uh, Charlotte's promos, like I I don't find her the best on the mic. Her in ring is truly something to behold at some points. And I I, I thought these two had a, a pretty solid match with some uh, good ch chemistry and a, a lot of psychology in it. Even though there was a couple of botches, I, I I enjoyed it. I thought it was really good. Do you see them doing the title change already next week? Mm -hmm. That would feel really quick. Yeah, yeah, it would, but. Yeah, like I, I, just, I think you could have held this title match easily off until backlash. I mean, it's, oh, it's, for sure. it's only four weeks uh, that we're talking about. And it's not as though, I mean, you're either going to continue this program. So you get a third match at backlash, right? Or, I mean, who else are you picking from the division at this point? Are you going to race to a Charlotte Natalia program already with both his heels? It just seems, um, this is just really rushing things, but We'll see. It could all be an angle next week as well, too. Yeah. Now, no, not to uh, sound uh, uh, stupid or not, but uh, there's a show this Sunday, right? No. Or is it next Sunday? It's a week. Sunday is payback. And that's that's the, the raw. raw show. That's the raw pay per view so with SmackDown confused. champions <laughs> defending. Okay. Yeah. All right. You do need a scorecard, Dave. Yeah, it's, I know. Right? It's mind boggling. <laughs> Next was the Colognes, no longer the Shining Stars, Primo and Epico taking on American Alpha, which uh, let us let us uh, not worry about the elimination of the Shining Stars moniker. Yeah, but and, and they didn't even get an entrance here. So right away, I'm thinking, <laughs> OK, so. Well, they're not stars anymore. This yeah. was made very clear. <laughs> oh, boy. Gable slammed Primo, took his back and is cross facing him, isolates the arm. 
hit this bridging northern lights with Epico then distracting the referee and Gable gets sent shoulder first into the post. Yeah. As they got the advantage on him, Gable came back with an arm bar and the ropes to Epico, tagged in Jordan, who fired up, the straps come down, and the referee was distracted, allowing Primo to hit an Inziguri to Jordan from the apron, and then Epico using a sunset flip to get the pinfall. They only went three minutes and 13 seconds, so this was really rushed on a show that did feature some uh, lengthy matches. So the Colognes get the win, and this feud feels like it's going to progress, and uh, I was definitely looking forward to these two teams having um, a series of matches together. Th- this was kind of not really, I think, uh, meeting the potential of what you think these four could have together with a, a lengthier match. Yeah, I, like first off, I didn't even know American Alpha was still wrestling. I thought they might have been injured or something. It had been a while since I had seen them. Like I didn't see last week or anything of that like that. But uh, and Epico really looks good in the in the ring. That double underhook into a gut buster that he did was really really sweet. Uh, he's got he's got a lot of ta- well, they both have a lot of talent. And I also found that uh, JBL seemed to be uh, really nice and complimentary to everybody. I was I was wondering what that was all about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll chat more about the colognes later in their, yeah. uh, their, uh, their epic co-appearance uh, on Talking Smack. Epic co That's nice. I like that. Uh, we got another Lana promo with uh, her dance routine, which was um, the source of some controversy last week because there was an article on, I believe it was Bleacher Report, by someone very critical of her dance routine, that it wasn't very good. And Lana got very upset about this uh, critique of her dancing. Oh, I didn't even see that. I, I didn't so, like, I didn't see last week's show. So I, I had no idea that she well, was coming. Well, yeah, the, the, this was very much the same promo as last week where she's doing this, this dance on top of a chair at the SmackDown entrance. And it seems as though her and Rusev are going to be, maybe have a pseudo connection on the show. But later Renee was making it pretty obvious on the, on talking smack that, her and Rusev are kind of going to be going in separate directions on the show. Kind of okay. kind of like a Cena Nikki thing where you know they're together but it seems like they'll be apart in their respective sides of SmackDown. And where did where did Rusev end up? Rusev is on SmackDown but he's hurt at the moment. Oh, okay. Okay. So, we'll see. But they're not he, together. It it doesn't <laughs> seem like it. So, we're going to find out. Lots of lots of questions. Dasha interviewed Ty Dillinger. He says the fans made their voices heard, and he threw to a video of himself to explain what the fans see in him. So <laughs> him and Bray Wyatt getting into their uh, into their editing software. And we come back, and he simply says, and that's why they call me the Perfect Ten. Perfect Ten. And hey, Jinder hey. is our new number one contender. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. They could they could form an alliance, the perfect contenders. Oh, oh my God, you're good at this. <laughs> Kevin Owens comes out, and he is going to have his first ever Face of America Open Challenge, if I got this right. Yeah, I like and it. And it is answered by Gary Gandy. And Owens kicks Ke- Greg Hamilton out, does his own introduction, and asks his opponent's name, and he says it's Gary Gandy from... Louisville, Kentucky. Owens just attacks him in the corner. Gandy barely gets up for this pop-up powerbomb, and Owens wins in 30 seconds and then just steps on top of Gandy after the match. I don't know if he was too impressed with the the vertical of Gary Gandy, which is not going to be measured. No, he he jumped a little early. I saw that. And I, I, what I did uh, notice was Owens announced himself from Montreal this time instead of uh, Maribel. Oh, that's a, yeah, yeah, you're right. He did. Yeah, he said Montreal, so I guess he's trying to change because his character. Because now, now it's part of the character, the uh, the fact that the face of America, obviously, from Canada, and now that it's part of it, I will bet that they felt, oh, no one knows what the hell Maryville is. It's Montreal. Yeah, exactly. And you just, you, it's the Bobby Roode syndrome. It's like, okay, you can be from Ontario, but you're not going to be from Peterborough. You're from Nobody Toronto. Peter. No one's heard of Peterborough. <laughs> He tells the lazy Americans to put their hot dogs down and says as long as he is champion, he will remain the face of America. Jericho won't take that away, and neither will Styles. and he will now provide a Canadian perspective on commentary and ends his promo by speaking French before joining Tom Phillips, JBL, and Byron Saxton for the main event. It is strange how 
it feels like the U.S. title features more of the main event talent than the actual mm -hmm. WWE title. But I do like Owens having this American attachment now. I think this is uh, something that can work for him. And honestly, I don't think too many people are going to complain about an Owens Styles uh, program coming out of Payback. Yeah, oh, oh, for sure. And I think it's just like, like the shock of the Jinder Mahal thing is uh, going to be it'll it'll go away as soon as we get this going with the Kevin Owens and uh, uh, AJ Styles because like realistically, Owen David, if these are the top two programs. And you really want to put a lot of heat on the U.S. title. And just for structuring a show, what's the harm in putting Owens and Styles in the main event position at, at Backlash in Chicago? Oh, wow. Can you imagine yeah, I... what the heat's going to be like for that match as opposed to Orton and Jinder fucking Mahal closing <laughs> that show and having to follow Owens and Styles? That's insanity. Yeah, yeah exactly. You, you, I, I bet you it would even go on as um, as the headliner, Owens versus AJ. Like, you'd be it should. silly, it don't should. you? Like, yeah, because salivating to see that match that'll be fantastic aries had one of the uh classic 205 live promos i want someone to put a compilation of these 205 live promos together yeah. and put them up on youtube together one <laughs> after the other just to hit people over the head with how dull these are oh so, you don't like them uh i am not a fan of these and you know what it's not even the length of them and i don't know why i connected the two but over the weekend, uh, right before the Ryzen event in Japan, mm -hmm. Moro Ronaldo put up this video in his hotel room, and he's got his arms in the air, and he did, like, the exact length of one of these 205 Live spots, plugging Ryzen, and it was, like, only 100 thousand times better than these ones come off. So it's not an excuse of, well, you only have 30 seconds. Go back, I, to, go back to some of those Royal Rumble or Survivor Series promos that were 30 seconds and the characters that made those work. Like yeah, these 30 seconds is not it's not great, but you're not handcuffed so that they have to be this goddamn dull and referring to TJ Perkins as Teddy Joystick and sending <laughs> his smirk into Section 309. I laughed out loud at that. I thought it was great. I love I love Austin Aries, though. So. <laughs> well, he's trying his best. Uh, <laughs> main event saw Baron Corbin take on AJ Styles. Corbin dropped Styles on the edge of the apron, was working on his back. They went through a commercial. Corbin slid to the floor, returned, and then ran in to the post <laughs> with his shoulder. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> Styles hit the Pele kick. Corbin was seated, and Styles ran at him with a forearm. Styles then rolled into a calf crusher, but Corbin made it to the rope. Corbin then hit a deep six for a two count, and then Styles hit this sliding knee off of the apron to Corbin on the floor. Corbin then back body dropped Styles onto Kevin Owens, seated at the commentary <laughs> position, and they cut to this fan who was having an out of body <laughs> experience from this back body drop. Styles then blocked the end of days on the floor, leaped off the apron, sending Corbin, quote, into the WWE universe, and then Styles, with the uh, the WCW NWO World Tour style of victory for John Pollock in 1998, <laughs> won by countout in 13 minutes and 4 seconds. So, yeah, did you notice that the ref uh, rang the bell before he actually counted 10? Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah, he got to nine, and then AJ jumped in, and he just rang the bell. <laughs> like, so that's not an actual win. Maybe he's going to be permanently replaced by Akira Tozawa after last week, which oh. you probably didn't see. But no, it, I didn't. It was Akira Tozawa ringing the bell under uh, a disguise. Oh. <laughs> but that was, that was SmackDown. Um, <laughs> certainly the most talked about thing coming out of this is Jinder Mahal, which I think we have shared our thoughts on. But uh, uh -huh. Start to finish, Dave, your uh, overall impressions of SmackDown, other than saying mind-boggling. Uh, confusing? Okay. <laughs> no, that, was, I enjoyed the show, you know, and uh, that, that main event I really liked. AJ made Corbin look like a monster. He did a really good job on that, and uh, the deep six he gave him was just phenomenal. Like, it was really, really good. Uh, overall, I, I liked the show. It, was, it, it wasn't that bad. Now, you purchased stock on Baron Corbin when he was a penny stock. Now, oh, did I ever. Now you haven't you haven't cashed in that stock yet. You are holding firm on the Baron Corbin brand. Without a doubt, I am. I think it's uh, it's going even higher and higher. Like he's 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 catching fire. And I, I like I like you said, I called it way back in the NXT days. So I, I love him. I think he's great. Do you feel it would have been too early to have gone with him and Randy Orton as a program? Maybe. 
maybe like I, I like the slow build that they're doing with them and like you you watch social media and uh, i get people tweeting at me all the all the time saying oh you were right i'm on board with him i really like him he's getting better and better i think uh, you, you give it time and he'll he'll take over like it would be a bit too early to go with that i think i'm not quite there with baron corbin but looking at this show and where people are slotted um mm-hmm. what do you see for baron corbin because he's kind of an odd man out now and much as you may not want to hear this i feel Sami Zayn could be on baron corbin duty next yeah, I could see that. Yeah, and that's that's all right because that'll be a good match. You're you're, you're they're trying to build this character, so they're giving him uh, a really talented workers to to make him look good, like AJ did tonight. If you go on to Sami Zayn with him, Sami Zayn will make him look like a million dollars. Teach him what he needs to know, and he's he's always learning. He's always getting better. Every time that you see him, he gets better and better and better. I at least I believe so. It's it's probably a good way to go. Do the slow build or the slow burn with him, and just keep getting him with more talented guys so he can learn more and uh, hone his craft a bit more. So now we'll go to Talking Smack, which was featuring Renee Young and Shane McMahon, which already... I, I, I am not a fan of Shane McMahon on this mm-hmm. show. He he tries. I feel he was more engaged on this show than others, but it's just... It's not a good fit for this guy. I don't no. feel... But, Especially when you start singing uh, Toby Keith right off the beginning of the show. Yeah, how strange yeah. was that? I mean, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> gosh, it was. Uh, they were playing that song on oh one of the one of the cable news stations when they were dropping uh, the the Moab and they played a Toby Keith song over top. It was um, uh, Geraldo was being interviewed and they they showed a highlight with a Toby Keith song over top. Um, like a bomb dropping and it was just the most bizarre thing um anyway so yeah it's 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 an appropriate tie-in because i I thought this show bombed overall Uh, yeah uh renee showed off a louisville slugger bat that she uh, received earlier today i thought she was gonna say she was uh presented this by jim Cornette, which he may have (laughs) even been at the show uh on uh tuesday night potentially Mm. Uh, Brian and Bree apparently are very close to having their baby, and that's why Brian was not here tonight. Mm-hmm. Jinder Mahal was on first. He says he will be the next heavyweight champion. He did it all by himself. Renee brought up the Bollywood boys, and Jinder no sold them. Yes. He said it was horrible that he was booed. He will become the new American dream. He's yeah. really pushing this as his new moniker, and says that he saw fear in Orton's eyes tonight, which... <laughs> I would be, too, if I knew I had to do 20 minutes with this guy in Chicago. (laughs) And says that he is a shark that got his first taste of blood on Tuesday. And Shane waits for him to leave before totally dismissing the idea of calling this guy the American dream (laughs) out of respect to Dusty. And really felt like this guy working his own angle on this show. Um, I I know you said you were kind of impressed with his talking after the match. Mm -hmm. Here on this setting... He still feels very mechanical, which is a guy is not going to become a good promo overnight, but I, I think he has a ways to go because he still feels like I'm playing a heel and these are the words that I should be associated with when being a heel. Yeah, that's true. Like, I, I agree with you on that. Like, he, he wasn't terrible or horrible, but he, he did show some some of that. And I, I, that's like the reason I like talking smack is really it, it gives a neat a needed platform for these superstars to grow and, and they can try new things and different things. Although, it, like like you said, I think Shane might be giving him a talking to after that about the, the new American dream. I don't know if he knew that that was coming up. Maybe maybe it's a new idea they have where Canadian heels on smack down have to have american references in their oh, names, right. <laughs> uh, uh, nicknames yeah he's from calgary right he's, he's from Cal- calgary yeah he's yeah. another canadian <laughs> so um which which is i guess a a uh, a populous enough of a city that it will be acknowledged like maybe he's from jasper originally but uh, yeah. it just becomes <laughs> calgary uh, anyway uh, but to your point i mean with this show featured all raw talent that had been uh, moved over in the switch. And and Mm -hmm. I think you saw these performers. I don't know if any of these performers even watched this show, understood the format or more importantly, understood kind of the platform you have on talking smack where no, it's not, it's not two and a half million viewers on USA, but it's, I kind of equate it to like the last sketch you see on SNL where 
that's where they'll throw something against the wall and yeah. maybe it bombs. Maybe it's just letting people take a risk, but maybe it turns into Wayne's world and it's <laughs> talking smack is kind of that last segment of SNL where these people that would never get these opportunities on SmackDown can go out and kind of craft their characters. They can get comfortable speaking it as their character without the constraints of a script. And some of them have been really successful, but on this show, like the Colognes, for instance, I, I don't think they really capitalized on that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Like, like even with Jinder trying the new American dream and that, so he, he did try something, but like the Colognes came out and just, didn't do anything. They just like they brought up the fact that they were tag champions five years ago and beat yeah. the Usos in a three way match at WrestleMania 28, which like Shane and Renee had no response to this. They were like, OK, I didn't uh, even know that happened. <laughs> Primo says, uh, do you know who the third team was? Take, uh, take a wild guess. I don't think you'll guess it. Mm, no, it was, I, uh, <laughs> Tyson Kidd and Justin Gabriel. Oh my God! Which that was think, a long think time of them? Ago. Think of them as a tag team today. I mean that that would be a hell of a team in today's tag environment. But yeah. in 2012, I mean the tag. I mean that this was a match on the pre-show at that year's WrestleMania to give you an idea. But I mean maybe that's where they would be today too. Primo were notes: they, Were they the Los Matadores back then? They were. I think they were. Okay. I, I yeah, think they, they were. Didn't talk, they they were talking about don't forget about this, don't forget about that, and like. But they totally forgot about that. <laughs> uh, mo most of their history is forgettable, uh, yeah. given the gimmicks they've been throwing. Primo just notes they aren't politically correct, which was another non sequitur here. I mean, it had no... I mean, what is non-political about you... Or not politically correct from Primo? I mean, yeah. these outspoken, shining stars. Um, anyway. Epico I, was, I was amazed at how, how identical they look since uh, Epico lost the cornrows he used to have. Like, I, I, they're, they're cousins, right? Uh, these two are cousins. Yes. Yeah, I, I can't believe how, how much they look alike. It's just amazing. Epico puts over his father, Carlos and Carlito, and says that the McMahon and Cologne names carry a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. um, Epico, wait, I'm trying to think now. Epico would be the nephew of Carlos, I believe, because Primo. Oh, Primo is Primo's Carlito's brother, right? Yes. Yes. Yes, so there. Epico is Carlito be... still wrestling? He still does. Uh, yeah, he still does does matches oh. here and there. Oh, okay. I mean, he's always stated, you know, if they made him an attractive offer, he would come back. Did the Hall of Fame induction a few years ago for Carlos? Oh, that's right. Yeah, all three of them, right? Yeah, they they were like severely cut on time, and Carlito was hilarious during that speech. I mean, he <laughs> did not give a fuck during that speech. It was really funny. <laughs> They talk about Lana's promos, and Shane just says, it's exciting. It's an opportunity. And then Renee notes, it will be interesting to see her apart from Rusev. So that yeah. leads me to believe they won't be attached like they were on Raw. Yeah. And then Charlotte, Shane really loved the word opportunity on this show. <laughs> oh, that, that's his go-to, yeah. <laughs> Charlotte is the final guest, and I was pretty disappointed here. Charlotte just seemed like a deer in the headlights on this show. Like, she just seemed, like, so worried about what she was going to say. Like, yeah, there was that one part where she just stared. Uh, she got yeah, the question. Yeah, an just awkward stared for stare before she lifted the microphone to speak. It was almost like this mechanical process we were watching in real time of her forming thoughts and answers. And she said she got the title shot because she had the guts to ask. Now she has a title match. She repeated that, I've earned it. I've earned it. She's the dirtiest player in the game. She got her catchphrase in and then ended it like this yeah. just felt. And, and I think this was one of the shorter talking smacks, because when Renee senses an interview is not going anywhere, she is not shy about just pulling the plug and ending yeah. things. I, to be honest, Dave, I thought this was one of the worst talking smacks I've watched just because it was a lot of new talent that hasn't had this opportunity. And I think most of them all whiffed on it and. I found, yeah. And coupled with the fact you didn't have Daniel Bryan there, who I think really can help these kinds of performers that are kind of lost out there. Just imagine if he was on this show, he would have been fantastic just oh. tearing these guys up. And like you think about it, the guys that we had, okay, so we had Jinder Mahal, we had the Colognes, and we had uh, Charlotte. And I found that uh, Charlotte was the least impressive out of the three. I agree. Of, I, I agree I, of all three. And believe me, that's not high praise given the first two. But yeah. <laughs> I definitely think Charlotte was the, the worst here. Yeah. 
Yeah, this. But it was a quick show, so that was all right. <laughs> uh, a- after two hundred five live, the quicker ones are not. Well, it becomes more of a chore at the end, but nonetheless, yeah. shorter was better. All right, so we go to the main okay. event of the evening, two hundred five live. <laughs> this was not a short show. This went oh. pretty pretty close to an hour. Yeah, <laughs> this was really long. Uh, it started off with Akira Tozawa against Tony Nice. Tozawa hit a senton for a two count. Dive got stopped by Nice. Brian Kendrick comes out. And Tozawa hit a Hurricane Rana, knocking him off the apron. Tozawa then hit his crazy tope. And then Nice hits him with a knee to the back. Tozawa is draped on the middle rope. And Kendrick goes to attack Tozawa. But referee Charles Robinson turns around and catches Kendrick, who does not hit Tozawa. And Tozawa capitalizes with a sunset flip, pinning Nice in five minutes and 48 seconds. Afterwards, Kendrick apologizes to Nice, turns his back, and Nice attacks him from behind. Tozawa laughs at Kendrick and says, lesson number three, you need to have eyes in the back of your head as he does his battle cry. So I don't expect anyone out there to have been keeping track of these lessons, but it does appear that Tozawa is now doing all the lessons (laughs) that Kendrick taught him in that order, which uh, eyes in the back of your head was one of the lessons from Kendrick. Yeah, I remember that. And like, I, I really liked Tozawa and I have since his, uh, in the CWC, but this, uh, Kendrick Tozawa is not setting the world on fire in any, any, uh, state of the, the word or the phrase. And, uh, like that, like you said, that diving headbutt or suicide diving headbutt is beautiful that he does. And he's got a real great smile. <laughs> he does have a smile. That's true. Like it's a great smile. <laughs> then Tom yeah, Phillips. It, it left me thinking, uh, where's Tajiri? Well, he got hurt, right? So yeah. he he injured, I think it was his knee. So I don't know when he's coming back. But to be honest, Dave, like if anything, there are too many cruiserweights in this division given yeah. the ones that are featured. I mean, yeah, that's if if, Grand Metalik is just he was there once and then yeah. disappeared. And you have so many guys like Tony Nese hasn't been on in weeks. Um, yeah. It's very few the guys that do get um, showcased at this point. Yeah. Um, I, I feel Tajiri would just be lost in the shuffle with it, with many of the other, uh, like your Lince Dorados. Um, after this, Tom Phillips, who could not have possibly been serious here, says he hopes that there are a hundred of these lessons to come. <laughs> Which, given this long-term decision, there may be a hundred of these yeah. lessons. They recapped the gift explosion in Alicia Fox's face last week, and then we got this segment. Oh my god. This went forever. Swan Swan comes out, and he invites Alicia Fox to come out, but instead Noam Dar comes out. He says last week was the most humiliating night of his life, and he asks what kind of man interferes in another man's relationship, which is only the 10,000th time he's used this line. Everyone Mm. gets it, just hitting you over the head. He calls Swan a rat, and then Alicia comes out, says that she thought Dar was the future face of 205 Live when she first saw him, but that he is immature, his cologne stinks, and he (laughs) thinks he can cook, but not in every room. Which I guess is a sex joke? I guess so, yeah. yeah. Alicia Fox may have, like, I, I... She's beautiful, she has the best arms in the women's division, like, but she completely made me tune out it, it this sucked it like it just plain sucked and it made makes no sense it's so bad she says she's been using dar finds it annoying when he, he pronounces her last name the way he does and tells dar that they are through tried to get the crowd to sing the goodbye song so dar leaves like a total dork yeah fox then thanks swan for all the gifts and he says they all came from his heart she leans in for a kiss, but Swan stops her and asks asks if she remembers Cedric Alexander. I think the crowd should have been asked if they remember yes. Cedric Alexander. <laughs> and Swan said he is one of his close friends. You broke his heart for a Euro trash pervert and says that there is a word for people like you as the crowd chanted ho, but says his mom taught him better and is not going to state that word but pretty much ensures, Dave, that she is going to be uh, chanted at mm-hmm. from this point forward when she comes out. So yeah. that's nice. Yeah, very and, nice. And I thought it, I, Corey had a great line there where he said, Rich, is, Rich Swan's mom raised him better than to say bad words, but not to wreck relationships. And in translation, I, I heard, this is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Fox then yells 
that being <laughs> single is better anyway. The crowd is all chanting what? And my the lone redeeming portion of this segment was Alicia handling the what chants because I, sh- I thought she was on the higher scale of them, yelling down the Louisville audience and then ending it by stating... You were slow on that last what. Yeah. <laughs> so I give her some credit at the end yeah, for the for what sure. handling, uh, but this was awful. Yeah, really bad. <laughs> this was awful, and no end in sight either. Yeah, I thought that was Cedric Alexander for a while. I <laughs> couldn't remember Swan's name. I'm like, uh, is that Cedric? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Mustafa Ali took on Arya Davari. They showed Davari showing up in a nice car earlier in the day. Graves mm-hmm. says, uh, in reference to Davari and his family's wealth, if you can't exploit your family, you don't need them. And Philip said, that is literally the worst thing you can say about your family. And this is a PG <laughs> program. Phillips was outraged by this comment by Corey Graves. Oh, man, he loves his family. Yeah, I, I honestly, I fast-forwarded most of this match after that sweet Corvette, you know. <laughs> Ali dropped, kicked him to the floor, followed with a somersault plancha. Davari then did a back suplex to Ali on the edge of the apron, got the advantage. Ali does his back flip off the top, lands a drop kick as Davari comes off the turnbuckle. He climbs up for the inverted 450, but instead Drew Gulak comes down with a megaphone and he chants, I'm not flying, I'm not lying, no high flying, and has a sign with the no fly zone that he is yeah. promoting. I, uh, yeah, this is where I I really got confused because like, what did I miss over the past couple of weeks? Because I thought Gulak was a woman hater. Now no, he doesn't no. like. You know, like <laughs> what the heck is going on? Now he hates the uh, the the high flyers. So yeah, and, and I, I thought it was kind of like it, it, it's. <laughs> are are <laughs> we are we dancing on the edge of a of a of a racially charged character this... here with the the two Middle Eastern performers and out no comes a guy with the no zone. fly zone on it like oh God. like is this as close as we're gonna get to the to the uh to the muslim ban being incorporated yeah. by a character on tv yeah i think i think you might be right on that but that uh the end that hammerlock close line and looked amazing it yeah. looked really good yeah ali was uh <laughs> was just uh encapsulated with this sign and was distracted allowing yeah. Tavari to hit the hammerlock clothesline and pinned ali in 649 yeah Backstage, mm-hmm. Dasha interviewed Gulak, who said tonight was the first steps in the bright future of 205 Live. This is the heel, so he's supposed to be lying. Mm-hmm. And there is no place for high flying with the likes of Ali. And he is speaking on behalf of the WWE Universe, and he wants to create a better 205 Live. Yeah, I found Gulak, he's confident on the mic, and it's nice to see him progressing. But yeah, this is this is bad as well. <laughs> it's just so tough on... 205 Live. Like, the atmosphere to me is such a killer. Um, the main event was TJ Perkins and Austin Aries. Graves compared Neville to Floyd Mayweather Jr. and that he could retire without losing ever again. Perkins spits in his hand when he goes to offer it, and Aries slaps it away. <laughs> Perkins used a head scissors and, apl- and applied it and then did a dab, which throughout the match, Corey was trying to get behind Perkins, but just would not. His his line was the dabbing, and he would not endorse his dabbing. Yeah, that uh, no one should be dabbing on television in 2017. <laughs> Aries hit an STO and a pendulum elbow, then did a reverse neck breaker in the ropes, misses with the 450, landing on his feet, and then Perkins locks on a knee bar, and this would set up the rest of the match with Aries selling his knee. Perkins mm-hmm. avoided a discus five arm, and then he went for that that uh, like double underhook, like the dodon that you see Taguchi do in New Japan, and they mm. just collapsed down. Which <laughs> yeah. it was definitely a blown spot, but in a weird way, it made you think that Aries might have actually torqued his knee in doing yeah. this. That it actually played to the story of the match with his knee. Because yeah, I think a lot sold of people like a champ. Listen, if his knee was, if this was just selling, Aries did a tremendous job, and I feel it was just legitimate good selling from Aries. Yeah. And this mat, this spot in a weird way, it worked for me uh, yeah, watching. For it. sure, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, he hit a running forearm in the corner, hit a 450 splash, but Perkins gets his foot on the bottom rope, then applies the last chancery, gets his foot on the rope. Aries continues to sell the knee, struggles to get Perkins back into the ring like he had to deadlift him off the floor. And Aries stops Perkins from hitting, hitting the detonation kick, hops off the shoulders, hits the discus five arm, and finally wins at 11:41. A really good match between these two. Mm-hmm. In particular, Aries and his selling of the knee. 
it, it's just the crowd heat. They just could not care during this this show. Yeah, that's true. And like I had zero interest in Austin Aries when he first debuted in NXT, but I swear he may be one of my favorite guys on any roster right now. And I give it give all the credit to his love for potassium. <laughs> his banana s- spots are fantastic. <laughs> this this show would be significantly hurt if you did not have Aries in the mix. I mean, oh, him, him and Neville are uh, they are the shining stars now that yeah. that name is free. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They can uh, take it. At the end, Neville ran out, attacked Ares, goes after the bad knee. Um, Ares countered and applied the last chancery, but Perkins returned to stomp Ares' chest and help him. They both took turns stomping him in the corner. Uh, Perkins hit the detonation kick. Neville applied the rings of Saturn and left Ares for dead. So this could be a case, Dave, where they go into the pay-per-view where Ares has the bad knee, uh, mm-hmm. which is a good story you can tell for the two. Uh, but that ended 205 Live. Um, just... This is a show that, to me, needs a, a creative change. Yeah. Um, I know this guy is a really popular writer on the main roster. I would love for them to experiment, and for three months, you hand this show over to Jimmy Jacobs, and you let him oh. run wild for three yeah. months. Like, it can't be worse than this. No, and it to can't me, be. He's worked with so many of these guys. He gets a hell of a lot of endorsements from the talent that does work with him in Mm -hmm. particular Owens and Jericho, who he is their guy, um, or at least was on raw. And to me like this show just needs a creative change. It's just a C level show at the moment. And it needs a new set of eyes with a direction. And this is their sole focus is two Oh five live. And I would love to experiment with that. Give him an assistant or two to write the show. And it's one guy's vision with a different view of things. And I think Jimmy Jacobs would be at the top of my list of people within that system um, that could do something with this show because it's dying to me, Dave, like this show is just dying to me and it's no fault of the talent. They're good. They're typically really good matches. Perkins and Aries was a great match, but it's a directionless show and the direction they do have that are long term that they have been telling for months is just nauseating with with the continuation of the Fox angle with the Kendrick Tozawa shit. Yeah. So I'm just I'm near the end of my patience with this show. Yeah, it's true that that Jimmy Jacobs idea is a fantastic idea. I'd love to see see what would uh, come of that because like like you said, they've got great talent. Like that match, that uh, last match was fantastic chemistry together. And seeing T, uh, TJP as a full blown heel is a nice change. He's looking a little bit better. And I love all of the uh, the submissions that they're using. The three of them. That's it, it, it's it's really neat. And I'd love to see some uh, new creative direction. All right. Uh, we are now going to head over to the law message board for some right. feedback. Uh, we will get to as many of these as we can. Starting off with Doug in Chicago, the site of backlash. Maybe he will get to see Jinder Mahal challenge for a title live and in living color. He says there were multiple times the announcers stated that the winner of the six-pack challenge would face Randy Orton down the line for the title. This was specifically stated multiple times, so does that mean that the House of Horrors match is non-title? If so... What the fuck? Why is Bray not getting his automatic title rematch? (laughs) I give up. Uh, Well, Dave, you were the first one to point that out to me. And now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know if they have ever specifically stated it's a title match. But I was always of the impression it was, just given it's the rematch, which they better make that clear. Yeah, they should. They should. They've, 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 like they've only got, what, a week and a half to do that. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, You go to Andark next. Uh, Jinder Mahal. That is all. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that's it sean from calgary the home of jinder mahal i'm actually glad to see the calgary boy win <laughs> because after the title shot and his new and this new indian stable provided vince doesn't give them a telemarketing gimmick jinder oh. should be a decent upper mid card guy so where do you think the bollywood boys will fit in the smackdown tag division think we'll see the jobbers from burnaby score the tag titles by the end of the year yes this is an all canadian yeah Indian faction with uh, the Bollywood boys and Jinder Mahal. I don't know where the Bollywood boys fit in. I mean, ultimately it would have to be in the tag division, but mm-hmm. I see in the, the immediate future, they're just going to be the, um, valets. Yeah. Like remember yeah. when Tajiri had his group with, with Akio and, uh, Ryan Sakota mm-hmm, as like yes. kind of just his muscle. Yeah. Um, and that's maybe what the Bollywood boys, I don't know if the Bollywood boys have ever been referred to as the muscle, but <laughs> that's kind of their role. I don't know if they'll be immediately integrated into the tag division. And they might as well use them for something because they were terrible on NXT. 
That's... I, I'm pulling this up now. This is on the WWE site. Okay. And for Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt, this is the preview of how it reads, okay? At Payback, Randy Orton will take on Bray Wyatt in the portentous unknown that is a House of Horrors match. Uh, after Orton overcame Wyatt and his mystical forces at WrestleMania to recapture the WWE title, he was quick, quickly dragged back into the Reaper of Souls' wicked agenda. Oh, my See, God. Seemingly <laughs> obsessed with avenging his loss, Wyatt, inter- Wyatt interrupted the title holder. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to skip through some of this. But what exactly is a House of Horrors match? Moreover, as of now, Wyatt is on Raw and Orton remains on SmackDown Live. Could this be the last time the superstars clash in their epic rivalry? Will the match be the maniacal... Okay. <laughs> Does it say title anywhere? <laughs> it says nothing about this being a title. Oh, good God. So this is this is quite the un- the uncovering by you, Dave, that this yeah. may... <laughs> Maybe Bray is going to win this match, and it's going to be like that Hogan Piper match at Starcade in '96, where oh, yeah. until Piper won, no one realized this was a non-title match. <laughs> oh, God. So there, that could answer many questions. Yeah. Well, on that point, let's go to Nick from Atlanta. <laughs> Guess they are not going to hinder gender. Charlotte going over Naomi may be the right move, but I think it makes Naomi look weak as a champion. Really showed that the women's uh, division on SmackDown is all heel without Becky. Question, given the rosters that uh, that each show has now, what SummerSlam programs would you like to see them build to? Do you see the SmackDown Women's Championship to Charlotte right away? Well, we went over that earlier. I can't see that happening right away. If they do, it would probably be a mistake. And uh, I actually like your idea about the uh, Corbin and uh, Sami Zayn. I'd like to see that. Yeah, that could be where they go for, for backlash. And then mm-hmm. in terms of SummerSlam, I guess it depends when Cena is coming back because he would be figured in um, for something big for SummerSlam. I, I love the uh, – I know everyone wants to see Styles and Nakamura, and I think long-term you can get there. I, I really want to see Cena and Nakamura mm-hmm. at, the, at the Barclays Center with that crowd. I think it would yeah. be awesome. Just no, that'd tremendous. be great. Yeah, save like uh, Nakamura and AJ for uh, WrestleMania or even like a, a Survivor Series. Like, like that, that, well, we all know what that match would be like. <laughs> uh, let us continue, and I'm going to skip down here to Jesse okay. from the Six. Okay, he says, I'm torn on the gender push. On the one hand, I'm always happy to see Canadian wrestlers and wrestlers of color find success. On the other, gender's not particularly good. It looks as though he'll be playing an awful stereotypical gimmick with the Bollywood boys. And lastly, that he gets a push only now, as he appears to have adopted the Scott Putsky workout plan. It definitely sends the wrong message. When guys like Zane or Heath Slater look in the mirror and wonder what they can do to get ahead, to what other conclusion can they come? Well, they've got a diet. That's the key. Dieting. No one diets... Like Jinder Mahal. He doesn't even know what a cheat meal is. No. God, no. Does, he does not. <laughs> uh, more Jinder stuff. Uh, how about Chris from Melbourne, Australia? This was a very boring episode of SmackDown. Other than both the world's and women's number one contenders being determined, nothing else really mattered. Question for John. Is ROH still for sale? Last I heard, WWE and Sinclair were in talks. Yeah. I mean, from from my gathering, the talks definitely they occurred. Uh, but it is not any kind of a priority at the moment, and it seems like it's at best a back burner issue. So I would say nothing is uh, nothing is imminent. But from mm-hmm. my understanding, like the talks definitely happened, but um, it's something maybe they revisit down the road. But it doesn't seem to be anything to uh, be holding your breath for. Gotcha. And question for Dave: Have you tried a Toblerone cocktail? I've recently been making them at work. Oh, uh, please tell us the contents yeah. of a Toblerone cocktail. That's something else. I'd like to try it. <laughs> this is like the, the the chocolate bar. How do you? I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. It's oh, you've a... never even heard of this? Never even heard of it. I'm I'm sure like a uh, creme de cacao and poof. I don't even know what you do. Uh, hazelnut, hazelnut uh, liqueur, maybe. Fact, fact or fiction? Does uh, pickle juice? Assist with a hangover the next day because of the sodium. Yes. It does. Uh, well, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, my wife hates it when I say this, but it's a wife's tale. So it's like, you know, it's, it's, in this I case, a know. husband's tale, maybe. There you go. Hey, there you go. <laughs> it's coming from, uh, from me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not too sure. I've, I've, I've been told that. Uh, I always use Advil. Advil's good. Um, my oh, goal is oh, never that. to be hung over again in my life, so I hope I never have to test so this. Terrible. <laughs> uh, let's go to – we're going to go to Brian from Kentucky, there who attended the show on Tuesday night. For the return of WWE to Kentucky, for the first time in years, this was a mediocre show at best. How did the crowd sound on TV? 
Uh, reactions were mixed in person. I didn't care for the six-pack challenge. The match was too long, and besides Zayn, no believable winner. Well, apparently none. Yeah. Then along comes Jinder and some cronies. Who are those guys? Well, we went over that. Charlotte yeah. and Naomi seem to lack chemistry. American Alpha was a concession stand break. WWE <laughs> has dropped the ball with those guys big time. Do you Huge. think they are, they are setting them up for Shelton Benjamin to come in and play the coach to make them great again? No pun intended. Oh. The backstage segments with the women were awful. Styles Corbin was a decent match to end on. Do you think Corbin gets added into a triple threat? 205 Live only stayed and watched it because Nakamura versus Ziggler was the dark match. Yeah, Nakam- there you go. <laughs> Nakamura got an equal reaction to that of AJ Styles earlier. I'd say two-thirds of the crowd stayed to see the match. Overall, my son and I had a good time. I'd give this episode a fast five <laughs> out of ten. It's <laughs> very nice. Uh, always great when we get live feedback. And, and there, yeah. there, there's the point to uh, saving Nakamura for a dark match if two-thirds of the audience stuck around. I would say the audience was fine on SmackDown, but um, not a pulse in that building for 205 Live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, where should we go now? Uh, how about, uh, well, let's do backs from Bangor, Maine. My God, SmackDown Live truly is the land of opportunity. Land of opportunity. I was certain that Mahal was going to spend his time brand jobbing to the likes of Baron Corbin, Nakamura, Styles, etc. And then he becomes number one freaking the number freaking one contender to the WWE Championship. This makes me happy only because it gives me a lot of hope for Sammy eventually getting that spot. Don't hold your breath. But at the same time, makes me question life in general. <laughs> Uh, we'll do two more. Yeah, okay. uh, I'm going to skip down to Brian from Louisville, Kentucky, who was also at the show, who noted this was the first televised WWE show in Kentucky since the Backlash event where the McMahons took on Shawn Michaels and God. <laughs> oh, God. Fandango <laughs> and Tyler Breeze beat the Ascension in a dark match before the show. Breezango played faces for the match. Thinking a face turn might be coming due due to the lack of babyface teams on SmackDown. I enjoyed the six-pack challenge, even with the surprise ending. The rest of the card was okay. I stayed for 205 Live just for the Nakamura dark match with Ziggler. 205 Live was hard to sit through. The crowd was dead, and the ushers spent most of the show moving people to fill the camera side. The Alicia Fox segment was brutal. I don't think I would sit through 205 Live again if they make a return. My MVP for the night had to be Ziggler. He put on a good performance in the six-pack challenge and comes out later and gives us a good match with Nakamura. Yeah, I'd love to see that match. I'd probably be a good one. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, why don't we end with this one from Germany? Okay, Garrett from Germany. I doubt that g- uh, gender won't be hindered anymore. I honestly cannot see them going through with that. Zayn will most likely get a rematch because of the interference and then go on to face Orton. My overall impression on SmackDown wasn't positive this week. The whole show felt kind of awkward besides AJ Styles and Kevin Owens. So I, well, they kept on stating that that was a non-disqualification match, so I can't see them getting him a rematch just because of that. Right. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> there you have it. Uh, well, thank you for all your feedback, including those that uh, were there mm. at the KFC yum center. Uh, I don't know if it was a yummy edition of SmackDown and two Oh five live, but nonetheless, um, we do have some programs <laughs> in place for better or worse going into backlash because I think both spectrums have been uh, filled as we have our two title programs. Yeah. That's going to wrap up the show, but a big thank you. To bartender Dave for filling in for a vacationing waiting who is in Chicago as we speak for a, a much needed vacation. Oh, my, thanks all. Uh, uh, thank you to uh, thank you, John, so much for giving me the opportunity. I had a really good time doing it, and uh, anything you need, I'm always here. And if you want to come see me, I'm at 2455 Bloor Street West. You can follow us at Brydens on Bloor and follow me at bartender Dave 74. And maybe if you vacation in Toronto, you can go to Brydens, and by then. You could order a Toblerone cocktail. I'm going to uh, research it. I'll, I'll make sure that it is on the menu. <laughs> well, that will bring this show to a close. Uh, we will be back later this week on Thursday. New edition of What's Next. We've also got the MMA report coming out where I will have uh, Cub Swanson and Stephen Wonderboy Thompson on the show. And then Friday on Review Away, uh, Toronto-based comedian Dylan Gott, who you may have heard on the Art of Wrestling podcast with Colt Cabana, he's going to be joining me as we review Starcade 88, True Grit, <laughs> Grit spelt with two T's, headlined by Ric Flair and Lex Luger, and the final match for Dusty Rhodes before he took off the first time uh, from the NWA right after the purchase by uh, by Turner. So lots to discuss from the NWA to end off their year of 1988 is coming up on Review Away. And then Sunday night on The Law, we will be joined by Pat LaProd, who 
is not only uh, recently coming out with a book on the history of women's wrestling, he's also been hired as a consultant on the new Andre the Giant documentary that HBO and the WWE are producing. So lots to chat with Pat about. And you can get all the shows up at LiveAudioWrestling.com. You can subscribe on iTunes. Follow Dave at BartenderDave74 at Law Radio. And we'll chat with you later this week.